live streaming is on. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the November meeting of the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society. Uh, we've got a, a really great program tonight. We have one of our esteemed uh, me members from the Astronomical League Top Brass that's come here to speak with us on a, the given topic. I can't remember exactly what it is, but we'll uh, toss every Koi and Koi and tell us directly. Um, so, Koi. All right, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. I'm glad everybody's uh, seemingly safe. We've we've had a rough go here in Louisiana for a while now. Um, I think we're coming out of hurricane season, we hope, right? Fingers crossed. But tonight we've got uh, Chuck Allen, and he's the current vice president, a past president of Astronomical League. He actually founded the League's National Young Astronomer Award back in 91, and he received the GR Wright Award for service in 98. He's also a League Master Observer and has given more than 500 public programs since 1960. He's also the program director for the Evansville Astronomical Society and a former judge for the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. So tonight, he's going to discuss the Cosmic Distance Ladder, which explores the historical advancement of distance determinations in astronomy. So everyone, please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Chuck. Don't forget to unmute your uh, telephone and not your uh, your web window. How are we now? That's the right one. You got it. Thank you. Is, is there a substantial delay? I need to know what the lag time is. If I raise my hand, tell me. Let's, let's do a five, uh, four, three, two, one. Go. Okay. It looks like about a looks like about a one second delay. Oh, okay, that's not bad. Well, first of all, uh, let me say thank you for inviting me. It's always fun to be with people in other clubs around the country. And one of the uh, advantages, if there are any, to this tragedy we're in the middle of is the ability to actually visit with more clubs now than we ever have uh, when we had to travel to do these programs, although I'd prefer to do that, obviously. Um, and uh, I know we're looking forward to, um, uh, looks like I've been muted here. I muted your screen, not your telephone. We were getting a double echo. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, we're, we're certainly looking forward to the opportunity maybe to have our convention down your way. I, I know that at least is in the advanced proposal stage at this point. Uh, I will say one thing about our conventions. We're, we're worried about Albuquerque again for obvious reasons. Uh, but we're not going to let anything that happens or doesn't happen in Albuquerque back up any future conventions. So I'm working on a convention in Cincinnati area, probably in 2022. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we're not going to keep backing up Albuquerque indefinitely. So hopefully we'll be able to have that convention in August. We'll, we'll have to see. So I'm going to go to share screen now. And Nothing's happening. I'm not getting any options. Boy, can you hear me? Yeah, the audio is good. And we had the screen sharing working earlier. Yeah, it's not working now. Okay. Um, I'm getting no pop-up up here. Yeah, I'm guessing this thing just doesn't work on Firefox. <laughs> That's the best guess that I've got. Um, so they, they usually test this wait on minute, every... Wait a Maybe... now, now, now I've got it. Hang on. I think we're, I think we're good. Hold on. Okay. How about now? Can you see the screen? 
Uh, not yet. Oh, it's a... Yeah, the, uh... Oh, dear. Okay, allow, it's allowed. Yeah, there, there you might Fire be facing a pop-up up blocker. That's it. There we go. And uh, now you'll just switch over to okay. the. the uh, yep. We see there a we beautiful. Are. We see a beautiful about black now? sky. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I We're wish good. our All sky right. looked well, like I'm this. I'm sorry for the. Uh, I'm a I'm a novice on Jitsi, and uh, I've had some mic problems, so I'm doing this by phone, and hopefully it'll work. I hope my voice is okay. Um, this is about the cosmic distance ladder tonight, and what we're going to be doing is looking at the historical advancement of our understanding of how we measure distances to things we can't pace off in person. And on April 26, 1920, which is just about exactly 100 years ago, there was a great debate held at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And it was about the nature of these things that you see here. This is an early photograph of M51, uh, not a high resolution photograph. Telescopes in those days were much smaller than what came along in the 40s and 50s. And so the nature of the spiral nebulae were up for debate at the Smithsonian. The debaters were Harlow Shapley and Aber Curtis. And Dr. Shapley believed that the uh, spiral nebulae were nebulous features on the outskirts of the Milky Way. He believed that the Milky Way was an island universe, unique in the universe, that it was everything in a vast empty space. Um, he believed that a nova that appeared in Andromeda in 1885 was far too bright to be in an object that was very far away. And he cited the research of another astronomer, Van Maden, who had observed M101 and reported observing rotation over a period of years, which is something you, obviously you would not be able to detect in a galaxy at great distance. Aber Curtis, on the other hand, believed what Immanuel Kant believed, that is, that the spiral nebulae were other galaxies like the Milky Way, that there were too many novae observed in M31 for uh, the object to be a small object nearby, that it had to be coming from a very large source. He also noted that the dark lanes in Andromeda were very similar to the dark lanes observed in our own Milky Way from Earth. And he said von Manen is simply wrong. He didn't do his research well. So just 100 years ago, that's how confused we were about the nature of the universe. And so how do we solve this debate, and how do we find out how far things are? And to get a handle on that, we've got to drop back in history a good distance, back to the 8th century BC. What you're seeing here are the ruins of um, the Festival of Zeus grounds in Olympia, Greece. Uh, up here, if you can see my cursor, are the treasuries where offerings were made to the gods. Down here were the baths. These baths were where the men would go and he served wine and trade stories. Uh, down here, uh, these were the dorms, basically, for the athletes. The priests' house were down here. This little area right here was the meeting hall. This is where people went to register for uh, athletic contests. And right here in the middle, the Temple of Zeus, it was in here that one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was, was kept, the statue of of Zeus himself, made of gold and ivory, of course, no longer exists. Up here, however, is a running track. It was called a stade. And it was here that the first events were held um, back in 1776, the first festival of Zeus in 776 BC. And it featured only one athletic competition, the stadium race. And here's a close up of the, uh, the race course. And the distance to the finish line has been a source of study over a number of years. The starting line is obvious, a line of stones, but the finish line, the exact location was not completely known. And so it's been the subject of research and it's important in our story. I'm, I'm hearing some um, sounds in the background. I'm not sure what they are, just in case, but... Um, 
Now, this stadium race was so important. And I don't know how old is your society. I'm not sure. But if you look back in your history, there are probably things you wish had been recorded better. You could go back 60, 70 years and come up with uh, maybe some better history. It's hard to do. Things get lost in the fog of time. Yet oddly enough, at these festivals of Zeus, which we now refer to as the ancient Olympics, this stadium race was conducted at every festival of Zeus every four years for a period of over a thousand years. And the winners of all of those races held over a period of 1,013 years are known to us. They were recorded and we know every single winner starting in 776. The first winner was this guy. His name was Corabus of Ellis. He were, uh, lived five miles away. Um, he won heats and the final at the first festival of Zeus. He's a cook. Um, he went home. He didn't have to pay taxes. He didn't have to pay for food anymore. He uh, was treated as a hero for the rest of his life. We even know where he's buried. And Corabus distance became very important. The distance he ran became very important in understanding the work of Eratosthenes uh, about 100 years, or excuse me, about 500 years later. Eratosthenes uh, was a, a uh, librarian at the Great Library of Alexandria in Egypt, which, of course, was then part of the Greek Empire of Alexander. He was a mathematician and a geographer, an astronomer, and a poet. And he had measured the tilt of the Earth's axis, and he gave us leap days. And at age 36, in 240 B.C., he undertook a project to measure the size of the earth. Now, the way he did it was he had gone to the town of Syene, which is today's Aswan, down here in southern Egypt, and had observed that on the day of the, winter, the summer solstice, on June 21st, roughly, that the sun shone directly down into a well, that it was directly overhead, making Syene on the tra Tropic of Cancer. He knew that based on camel travel time, it was 5,000 stadia to the north to the city of Alexandria. So he thought, if on June 21st, I go up to Alexandria and stick a pole in the ground, also vertically into the ground, that the, sh the sun will shine at an angle on that date. And if I measure that angle, I'll be able to determine the circumference of the earth. And so he did this, and he got an angle, a, a shadow angle of seven degrees, and because we're bisecting parallel lines here, assuming the rays from the sun are parallel, that means that seen from the center of the Earth, Syene and Alexandria subtend an angle of seven degrees, seen down here. That's about one-fiftieth of a circle. So 50 times 5,000 gives you 2,500, uh, excuse me, 250,000 stadia. Now you see the importance of knowing how long a stadia is, a stade, a stade is, if you will. These are the stade names in the research that's been done, and the most well-accepted one is the Olympic distance, the distance that Corbus ran, about 192 yards or 176 meters. Based on that, we can conclude that uh, the circumference of the Earth, and this was Eratosthenes' measurement, 27,280 miles. He got it within 10%. 9% is all he missed it by. Why did he miss it? Well, it turned out Alexandria wasn't due north of Syene. It was slightly north, northwest. Had it been further north, the angle would have been more than 7 degrees, and he would have gotten a slightly smaller circumference, more like the 24,960 that we know today is accurate. So he did an incredible job. This uh, experiment, by the way, was repeated in 2012 by a fellow by the name of Anthony Mara. Uh, he had better assumptions. He knew that his gnomon in the north was due north of Syene, and he only missed the actual circumference by 16 one-hundredths of a percent. So it's an amazing thing. Once we have the size of the Earth, then it's a question of, well, how do we get the size of the moon or the distance of the moon? This is another problem, and this was taken on by a fellow by the name of Hipparchus. Hipparchus was born about four years after Eratosthenes died, uh, and in 189 BC, he did some thought experiments based on some research of eclipses that had occurred that allowed him to measure the distance to the moon. He knew from lunar eclipses, for example, that the uh, 
Earth's shadow was about two and a half times bigger than the moon at the moon's distance. He could determine this simply by the curvature of the Earth's shadow superimposed on the moon during lunar eclipses. Keep that in mind, 2.5 times bigger. He also knew that any ball at roughly the Earth's distance from the sun casts a shadow that's 108 times the diameter of the ball. Now, obviously, this is not the scale. But this is true of the Earth or the moon or a basketball. Uh, hold up a ball to the sunlight, the pinnacle of the cone of shadow of the umbra will be 108 times the diameter away. And then he realized, well, the moon also has a shadow that's 108 times its diameter, and that shadow barely reaches the Earth. During total eclipses of the sun, the spot created by the shadow of the moon is very small, as we all know. So he did a thought experiment. He said, let's just take this lunar cone here that has the same angle A as the Earth's shadow does and just pop it in underneath like this. We'll put the moon here so that it's only one part in 2.5 compared to the shadow of the Earth seen at the moon's distance. And we've got these interior angles that are the same. We've got parallel lines here. So these two triangles here and here are similar triangles. They all have sides that have ratios of 2.5 to 1, whatever their distances happen to be. He knew that 1 plus 2.5 units here equaled roughly 864,000 miles. He knew that because Eratosthenes had given him the diameter of the Earth. 108 times that's 864. Now, if you take one part out of 3.5 of 864,000, you get 246,857 miles. That is exactly in the range of the actual distance of the moon, which is 226 to 252,000 miles. A stunning bit of work on his part. The sun is another problem, however. We don't have shadows being cast on the sun from eclipses. So how to determine the distance to the sun? Well, this gentleman, Aristarchus, thought he had a plan for doing this. He was a contemporary of Eratosthenes, actually before Hipparchus determined the size and distance of the moon. Um, but he felt that there was an experiment that could be done that would help him determine how much further the sun was than the moon, so that whenever we determined how far the moon was, which Hipparchus eventually did, we would know the distance to the sun. His method was this. He wanted to observe the exact moment of first quarter of the moon. He wanted to get to a point where you could look up and see exactly 50% of the moon's surface illuminated. He knew that would be less than 90 degrees. If it were here at 90 degrees, we'd see more than half of the moon illuminated. And he needed to calculate this angle here from the sun to the first quarter moon. So he picked a time when he felt the moon was at first quarter and calculated this angle, which is, certainly couldn't have been easy, as 87 degrees. Once he had that, it was a simple matter of trigonometry, which they had. We had one unit of distance to the moon. He didn't know how many miles to the moon, or stadia for that matter. But he knew whatever it was, he could calculate how much further the moon was by simply taking in trig, if you remember this from high school, the cosine equals the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, or 1 over d. The cosine was known to be this. D equals 19 times further than the moon. That's the number he came up with. Actually, the sun is 400 times further than the moon. He blew it because the true angle of first quarter moon is not 87 degrees. It's 89 degrees in 50 minutes. And that error made a drastic error in his calculation. It was never really trusted, though. And so for 1,900 years, we really went without ever knowing how far the sun was. The problem wasn't solved until the 1600s, when James Gregory, a really incredible mathematician in Scotland, came up with a plan. This is the gentleman who invented the Gregorian telescope. He provided the first geometric proofs of the basic theorems of calculus. He created the diffraction grating, observing refraction off of a bird feather. He died, unfortunately, at the age of 36. He was showing his students Jupiter's moons in a telescope and suffered a stroke and died a couple days later. 
But in 1663, he wrote down a method for determining absolutely the distance to the sun. Um, He couldn't do it himself, not because he died, but because he needed something to occur in his lifetime that wasn't going to occur, and that was the transit of Venus. There wouldn't be a transit of Venus until 1761 and again in 1769. So he wrote down the method. And the method was simply this. You put two observers at two different locations on the Earth's surface, let's say with a baseline of 3,600 miles. They both observe Venus to be at two different locations on the sun's disk. This has to be measured very carefully. Now, if you imagine someone standing on the Earth looking at these two spots on the sun's disk, that would subtend a certain angle, E. From Venus, that angle would be wider, obviously, because you're closer to the sun. It would be E divided by 0.72. This number was known thanks to Kepler. Even though we didn't know the distance to the sun and hence did not know the distance to the planets, Kepler was able to determine relatively how much further planets were compared to the Earth's distance based on their orbital periods. He knew, for example, that Venus's year was 62% that of Earth, and from that, using his research, he determined that it was 72% as far from the sun. So this angle would be bigger. So let's suppose for a moment that someone standing on the Earth would see these two points on the sun as 0.005 degrees apart. Someone on Venus would see it as 0.008 degrees apart. All right? Now, here we have opposite interior angles. So this angle right here would be 0.008, looking back at these two points. We can divide it in half, 0.004 degrees. Half the baseline, 1,800 miles. It's a simple right triangle, and we're right back to trigonometry again. And the trigonometry tells us that the opposite side, 1,800 miles over D, with an angle of 0.004, the tangent of that, uh, is 0.000698, which equals 1,800 over D, and he got 26 million miles to Venus. He knew that was 28% the distance to the sun and calculated, therefore, could calculate that the distance was 93 million miles to the sun. Again, this actual experiment was not done by James Gregory. It was done by a fellow by the name of Lalande, Uh, who observed the transits of Venus uh, in 1761 and 1769 and gave us, in 1769, this 93 million mile distance. From that, instantaneously unfolded all the distances to the planets. Well, what about stars? It's fine to determine the distance to the sun with two points 3,600 miles apart, but stars are vastly too far away to use parallax like this to determine their distance. But fortunately, the Earth changes position every six months with a baseline of 186 million miles. And this allows us to detect a shift in the position of a star against the distant background stars. This is sort of like holding your thumb out and closing one eye and opening the other eye and seeing your thumb shift against the background. This works for stars up to a couple hundred light years. When they're further than that, though, the shift is too small to be detected. And that's where Harvard College Observatory came to the rescue. These ladies seen here were called computers. In those days, because of sexism, Women were not permitted to use the telescopes there, but were hired to do a lot of the research and cataloging of the observations done by the astronomers. Edward Pickering was the director of the observatory, and one of the computers he had was this lady, Henrietta Swan Leavitt. Uh, If anyone should have ever won a Nobel Prize, it should have been this lady. Uh, She was deprived of it because she died of cancer before she could be considered. The Nobel Prize Committee actually wrote to Harlow Shapley asking about her as a possible nomination, and she had already been dead for a couple of years. Once you die, you're not eligible for Nobel Prizes. She was paid only $10.50 a week because she was basically a person of independent means. And her job was to record uh, data on sepia variable stars. And in 1912, she was recording the periods of sepia variables their visual magnitudes, and if their distances were known because of parallax studies, uh, their absolute magnitudes. 
I'm sure most of you are aware that CFID variables um, have a very peculiar light curve. They're very easy to detect. And the brighter they are, uh, the longer the period tends to be. Now, absolute magnitude uh, is the brightness that a star has at a distance of 32 light years. So if you take the sun and back it out to 32 light years, its visual magnitude would equal its absolute magnitude at that distance. So here's what Henrietta Leavitt was doing. She was recording stars by their period, the CFIAD variables, according to their period in days versus their absolute magnitudes. So for example, here we have a star alpha. It had a period of two days, let's say. And she knew from parallax that it had a distance of 32 light years. Therefore, its visual magnitude of plus three would be its absolute magnitude because it's at the standard distance. So she would plot that here, two days plus three. Beta, two days, she knows it's 320 light years away as a magnitude of plus eight. Okay, that's five magnitudes or 100 times dimmer, which means that it is, of course, 10 times further or 320 light years. So that makes perfect sense. So it, too, has an absolute magnitude of plus three. She noted that four-day uh, four Cepheid variables at 32 light years had absolute magnitudes of zero, and that all other four-day Cepheids had absolute magnitudes of plus zero. Here's one she knew to be at 320 light years. It appeared predictably 100 times fainter, and so it had an absolute magnitude of zero as well. So she started plotting these, and she was able to plot a correlation between the period of the sepias and their absolute magnitudes. They became standard candles. So for example, if she saw a star called epsilon uh, that was a sepia variable that had a period of four days, and she did not know its distance, but knew its, its visual magnitude, okay, this would allow her to determine the distance to the star. Now, how do you do this? Well, we know that it's four days, so it has an absolute magnitude of zero, okay? Yet, if you'll notice here, it's exactly one million times fainter in visual magnitude than a star at the standard distance, which means it's a thousand times further, or 32,000 light years away. And so Henrietta Swan Levitt's method allowed us to extend our understanding of distances to stars all through the galaxy and indeed even into the Magellanic clouds. Uh, there she found a number of Cepheid variables and once again, they were all known to be at about the same distance and sure enough, their absolute magnitudes matched that. But the galaxies beyond that were a little bit more problematic until Edwin Hubble came along with a new telescope built on Mount Wilson, the 100 inch. And with this, came the discovery of a Cepheid variable in Andromeda. And with the discovery of that Cepheid variable using Henrietta Swan Levitt's uh, amazing period luminosity uh, chart, he was able to estimate the distance to Andromeda. Now he came up with 750,000 light years. There were some inaccuracies in the measurement of the magnitude. It's actually two and a half million light years away, but it solved the great debate, finally. Uh, the 1917 work that he did, uh, or started in 1917 and completed in the 1920s, resolved the issue that the galaxies, uh, the spiral nebulae, were other galaxies. Curtis and Kant were right. Shapley and von Manen were wrong. But Hubble went even further. He detected that as he observed galaxies that seemed further and further away, smaller and fainter galaxies, that their light was shifted toward the red. Telltale lines of hydrogen and potassium, for example, appeared shifted further and further red uh, with increasing distance. He discovered the expansion of the universe, the fact that the light gets stretched the longer it has to travel through expanding space. So what he was able to do, observing Cepheids, let's say, in these two galaxies, he was able to correlate uh, the brightness of the Cepheid variables of known absolute magnitude with the degree of redshift. And once he had that correlation, even in galaxies where he was not able to observe Cepheids, he was able to use the redshift to determine distance from the Earth. 
This was later refined. Uh, it was refined by looking at globular clusters in galaxies. Uh, here is uh, the Sombrero galaxy uh, showing its, gal uh, its uh, globular cluster uh, arrangement. Um, based on studies of clusters close in and far out of galaxies, there were sort they became sort of standard candles, which confirmed Hubble's estimates of the distance based on redshift. An even more accurate method came about later. Uh, this method involved the use of type 1A supernovae. Uh, when stars become red dwarfs in the vicinity of a, a excuse me, red giants in the vicinity of a white dwarf, the uh, material on the red giant will start to accrete onto the surface of the white dwarf. And it, when it reaches a certain mass, it explodes, giving us a type 1A supernova. But it always does so when the mass is the same. So the brightness, the absolute brightness of type 1A supernova is standard. It becomes a standard candle that can be used to confirm distances and, in fact, uh, has done so. So when we see a type 1a supernova in a galaxy, observing its absolute magnitude, maybe observing Cepheids in the galaxy, comparing the data with the period luminosity diagram, we find that they match. And suddenly, we have a very accurate measure of the distance to a particular galaxy. So knowing uh, this, we can observe type 1a supernovae in extremely distant galaxies, some so far away that we can only see the type 1a supernova and not the galaxy itself. Um, so the bottom line is that knowing how far a youth ran 28 centuries ago in Olympia, Greece, um, has unlocked for us the size of the Earth, from that the distance to the moon, the discovery and use of parallax, and it started us on a journey to measure distances to the furthest galaxies from which light has ever had time to reach us. The most distant of which is this one, uh, GNZ11 in Ursa Major. The light travel time from this galaxy, 13.4 billion years. Its current location today, 32 billion light years from Earth. Uh, so we can't use a tape measure. We can't pace it off. But through clever research, we can do amazing things with distance. So right now, I will try to unshare. And let's see. There we go. Does that work? That works beautifully, I think. OK, so great. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was a, yeah. a lovely and important presentation. You finally. I don't know. Sometimes somebody explains something to you in just the right way, and it finally clicks, and it finally occurred to me how <laughs> type 1A supernovas are used to measure distance. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really appreciate that. No, that's, that's um, all right. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer I, I'm a little curious. I remember hearing on one of these little radio shows that there was some dispute now about the uh, the standard luminosity of type 1A supernovas. Is that mm -hmm. Did I hear that right? Um, and how yeah, that they would affect the... Uh, that is a measure of distance. They have been, uh, they were a predominant source of the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe, Nobel Prize winning work a few years ago. And um, so naturally that's, anytime you come up with major research, other scientists attack it and try to find fault in it. And so there, there are some discrepancies there. And, you know, we still don't have an accurate lock on the Hubble constant. Uh, estimates range between 63 and 74, you know, kilometers per second. So it's very difficult to, uh, it's very difficult to isolate these things with precision. But the distances that astronomers use to measure when we refer to distances to galaxies, they just use the Z number. So okay. if the light from a galaxy has been stretched double its normal wavelength, like potassium light, for example, appears double what it would if we burn some of the Bunsen burner here. Uh, we give that a Z factor of two, and astronomers like to refer to that as the distance without necessarily according uh, mileage to it, if you will. Um, it's very difficult to talk about distances to galaxies, and I cover this in a different program on cosmic horizons. You've got a galaxy that, like GNZ11, I said, it had a light travel time of 
uh, 30, of uh, 13.4 billion uh, years. Uh, so how far away is it? Uh, and I hate to re reprise an old comment about what the meaning of is is, but um, you have uh, where was the galaxy when the light left there? The answer is it was closer than 13.4 billion light years. You have the question of uh, where is the galaxy today? The answer is 32 billion light years. So what's at 13.4 billion light years? And the answer is nothing. That's simply how far the light traveled after leaving there. So th yeah. these things become complicated when you talk about distance, and that's why astronomers just use the uh, Z number for the redshift, which is way more than you asked me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that, that, that actually is a, I, yeah. I love the elaborative answers. It, uh, it yeah. leads you to more interesting questions. Yeah. No. Um, but. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and open up the, uh, the, the floor to, to questions from everybody else. Uh, just unmute yourself and ask if you've got any questions uh, that he can possibly answer. Uh, let's let's yeah. not have any. Yeah, I, mean, yeah I, had, I had one. I read an article uh, not a few months ago that said that white dwarfs that were rotating very rapidly in conjunction with a red giant, that rotation can skew the uh, amount of mass that accretes before explosion. And it was exactly. a huge that's, number, but it was significant. Yeah, that's that's part of the problem. Of course, it's not the only thing we use. We still have the the redshift versus Cepheid work, you know, that that Hubble used. And um, so, for example, if we observe Cepheid variables in a galaxy 100 million light years away and one 500 million light years away, and we detect the amount of redshift change because of the amount of space that's expanding. We can extrapolate that to galaxies that are beyond a distance where we can detect sepias in them. And they've tried to use this to calibrate uh, the brightness of type 1a supernovae. And that's where they've detected this difference. And, and that is a very valid point uh, that has uh, brought into question its usefulness as a standard candle. It was just one of the tools that was used to try to estimate distance. It's not an exact science yet. Right. I have, a, I have an, another question. With, um, yes, sir. With parallax and very bright stars, like I was looking up some distances to Rigel and, and, uh, and Antares, and you, can, you find distances all over the map. It's got a variance of about 30%. And one method gives one answer and others give other answers. Is there any way they can refine that better? If Hubble spent time doing the work, yes. Uh, but Hubble's got more important work right. to do. A, a lot of that's telescopic. A lot of it's based, you know, you've got atmospheric effects. <laughs> and simply the brightness of some stars makes it difficult to detect parallax. A little harder than a faint star. Another thing you need to bear in mind, um, in, in addition to this, if you have if you have the orbit of Earth facing the star, then you have the 486 million mile baseline. Right. Okay. If it's like this, you don't. For example, um, if if I'm um, if I'm dealing with a star that's skewed at an angle, it's going to be perhaps less than the 486 baseline. So that, that increases the inaccuracy of using parallax. Doesn't eliminate it, it just makes it more rigorous to determine the actual, actual distance. All right, mine is more comment than question, but, and I think mm -hmm. this is probably true for each and every one of us, like Scott was talking about type 1A supernovas and the significance. But for me, the, uh, the appreciation of distances in, in space, whether it be, you know, universe, whether it be, you know, galaxy, that sort of understanding for me was when I saw a presentation on the Venus transit, right? And this, of course, we, we all caught the buzz over the Venus transit and so it was, it was a topic of conversation that really got our enthusiasm going. So for me, um, my appreciation for understanding distances is linked to 
my experience with the Venus transit, but now you've introduced, you know, other parts of history, you know, going back to the, the Greeks that now every time I look at ancient Greece, I am not going to see it the same way ever again. Yeah. It was remarkable work that those fellows did back then. I mean, when you consider the uh, Hipparchus, almost all of his work was based on reports of eclipses. And he, he traveled to Turkey to visit an, a total eclipse site, made some measurements. Um, but, uh, you know, to come up with that accurate a distance to the moon, just based on observations of eclipses, uh, it's remarkable. And he hit it right on the money. And even Aristarchus' idea was right. It was just hard for him to measure the angle between the first quarter moon and the sun. How would you do that in those days? You know, the sun's over here and refracted near the horizon. You're not sure because of craters, you know, whether you're right at 50% illumination. So he did the best he could, but the, the theory was completely valid if he could have measured it perfectly. They, if he could have, Hipparchus's work would have given him the distance to the sun. He could have measured it that precisely. Yeah, that was always my problem ago. with uh, with yeah. science was that um, I'm not a very good noter and observer, and uh, I don't have that kind of uh, accuracy with my observations. So to see that is is truly amazing. That that's the the artist's gift along with the the mind to do the mathematics. So that that's something special. All right. Anybody else? I just recall when I was 18 years old as a freshman at LSU, I just dove right into astronomy. That's what I wanted to do. And I was just terribly disappointed when the first two semesters, all we talked about were, you know, doing flux equations, Doppler shift, redshift, blue shift. It was um, something that after two semesters, I was like, okay, I'm out of here. But over the years now, and especially the way you've presented it, 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 it puts things together. Um, that's what I would now call myself a novice, novice astronomer um, and, and more into viewing. But at the time, my 18-year-old mind couldn't correlate the two. So it's pretty amazing when you can appreciate uh, the mathematics and the relationship between that of time and distance when you're looking at something, whether it's through the eyepiece or just looking up into the sky, um, there's much more wonderment about it now than it was back then. But thanks, very good presentation. Very appreciated. I, I appreciate it. It's, uh, of course, the Greeks had access to trigonometry and, and the, the math that was in this program was just trig. You just look it up in a table and plug in the numbers, you know, the sides or the opposite side, the adjacent side, hypotenuse and right triangles. And I gave them all the answers. It's amazing. I have, to be fair question, for the I have a question for everybody then. Like at some point we're all going to be like, well, maybe I should drive north and measure the angle. It's not like who's, who's tempted to take that trip now, right? You, yeah, you don't, you don't have to go to the Tropic of Cancer. You can actually do it at any two latitudes. No, it's just... Uh, from Mamu to Shreveport. Yeah. <laughs> Just have to make sure your stick's vertical in the, in the ground and that the ground's level. Uh, you can do that with a, you know, a compass uh, or a bubble level, I guess. And just get permission to dig, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that, and um, I was going to say that uh, when you were talking about how the, the Greeks had trigonometry and all that, but to, to be fair, they were so amazed by this themselves that they, they attributed a religious component to it. Um, so, the, the, <laughs> um, which, yeah, yeah it, quite rightly so, I think that there, there is something just absolutely phenomenal about the universality of mathematics. Um, but, and, who, and who knows what was lost in the fire? at the library in Alexandria. I mean, that's one of the great losses in history. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's just almost unimaginable what was lost in, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's, that's always brings a tear to any classicist eye is the, the thought of what was in there. And, and, so, and you know, the, the, the amazing thing, 
historically, um, during the dark and middle ages, uh, all of, a lot of this learning was suppressed. For example, uh, in the late, in the early Renaissance period, uh, a fellow by the name of Toscanelli reinvented the wheel trying to estimate the size of the earth and came up with a circumference of 14,000 miles. And Columbus be- believed that that was the circumference of the earth. So when he arrived in the Bahamas, he thought he had arrived in, in Asia. Uh, simply based on the sailing time and, and the size of the earth that Toscanelli had estimated. So the learning of the Greeks that we know and that existed in the day of the Greeks was lost in the interim period. Uh, so fortunately recovered. Yeah, that, that's, it's something nice to, to be able to disagree with somebody and get to a right answer without the, the threat of an auto de fe. I, I suppose that's the yeah, lesson. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Okay. Uh, any other okay. questions? Thoughts on Greece and mathematics, or how absolutely astounding it is to to go from uh, you know the foot races to galaxy races, and uh, to what is it one stadia oh, they're, to, they're... to what is this thirteen point four billion light years on average? <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's. It, Mind there's, there's one other is. little historical uh, historical artifact I should mention. After James Gregory wrote down the method for determining using a Venus transit the distance <clears> to the <throat> sun, about 50 years later, Evan Halley came along and uh, wrote up a similar proposal, same exact method. Whether he knew about James Gregory's publication or not, I don't know, but they you, you will sometimes read that it was Halley's idea, but Gregory beat him by about 50 years. So, Well, that's just, and again, that speaks to the universal language of mathematics. That's yeah. uh, Leibniz and Newton and, and it parallel yeah, developments exactly. and everything. Um, um, but. And Galileo wasn't the first to drop balls at different weights off of a high <laughs> building either. That was done in the Netherlands before Galileo did it. History is a fascinating thing, and uh, uh, that's what amazed me so much when I, when I saw the list of all the stadium race winners from 776 to like 254 A.D., yeah. a thousand years of them. Who keeps records like that? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 they must be etched in stone somewhere is all I can figure. I, I'd love to know how that was retained. Uh, you can look yeah, it up. Me- uh, just good. Yeah. I don't think we've even been able to keep a common language for a thousand years. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have one observation that a lot of people don't know about is that in the Islamic world, in the, about 1000 to 1200 AD, they were doing magnificent things in optics and physics. Mm-hmm. And some of, that infra, some of that material has made it through. So there was quite a bit of astronomy <laughs> and science going on in the Islamic world around 1000 to 1200 AD. I, f- I found look at the names of all your stars. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's the, yeah, the, the, the stars are all named Al something or another, aren't they? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, they're, they're mostly uh, Arabic names. Yeah. Yep. Um. <laughs> Okay, uh, if we, I'll well, give it a second here to just make sure that the, the slow thinkers and slow speakers don't have anything left to say. Sure. Um, like that. That's that, that old trick with gifted kids is you give them a second to, to overcome their, their, their brilliance oh, yeah. in order to articulate their thoughts. Um. Well, just that this was an outstanding uh, presentation, uh, both uh, concise and well uh, said. It's usually an indication that uh, you know presentation or any written work is good by the fact that um, if you miss even a small part of it, you've missed a lot. And I think that's the case with this uh, with this presentation. It was uh, very substantive, informative, and clear. Well done. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. I hope you'll have me back sometime. Thank you very oh, much. We, 
love to have you back and i'm going to yeah. consider that an open invitation to ask um so yeah. that uh, with, with you may i love i love doing it i love doing great it, so. all right yeah. well thank you very much um yeah. and we'll go ahead and okay. uh let you go for the evening if you'd like and uh dismiss you with our, our gratitude yeah. and Hope uh then we'll thank you very much everyone. Someday. appreciate it okay thank you very much and uh, don't forget to hang up Bye-bye. the phone too <laughs> yeah and uh point yeah, it's, it's, we don't want to hear the oh boy afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, thank you much, very much to our, present, our presenter for the evening. This was uh, uh, Chuck Allen with the Astronomical League. And uh, he was talking to us about the, uh, the, the cosmic ladder on how to do distances over the long time. Or the, uh, the, everywhere from the... Uh, the lowest settings on the uh, the scale of fo- a foot race all the way to the furthest galaxy away. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this uh, meeting of the, the Batner's Astronomical Society for November, and I uh, hope to be back with another presentation